This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I'd like to uh, begin this program by making a, a very simple observation, and, and that is uh, by the time Conrad Black was released from a federal prison in Florida last May, uh, he had managed to discredit uh, the criminal fraud charges filed against him uh, to a degree that certainly shocked uh, many of his enemies, and I suspect also surprised a few of his best friends. Uh, Conrad Black is, of course, the Canadian-born businessman who, as the CEO of Hollinger International once presided over the world's third largest newspaper empire. He remains a world-class historian uh, who has published major biographies of both Richard Nixon and Franklin Roosevelt. He's also published two highly regarded memoirs, the latest of which is called uh, A Matter of Principle, uh, which describes in fascinating detail uh, both his legal problems uh, and his time in prison. Uh, and on top of all of that, uh, he is also a, a member of the British House of Lords, uh, Lord Black of Cross Harbor is his formal title, although I understand in prison uh, some of the inmates that uh, uh, he served time with uh, called him simply Lordy. Uh, Lord Conrad Black, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you, Manny. Thank you. You know, we could, of course, spend the next 22 days going all over the nuances of your case. Yeah, but, I, I uh, promise but, you my ambition to do it is no uh, greater than yours or your viewers. But, but in very broad terms, uh, this all started, it seems to me, in a serious way when an analyst at Tweedy Brown, uh, which is an institutional investor, began raising questions about whether or not you had been properly authorized to receive uh, tens of millions of dollars in management fees and non-compete payments uh, from properties that Hollinger had sold off. That's how it started. We flash forward five or six years later, and, and you're facing 16 criminal c charges, uh, the, the, the possibility of spending 101 years in prison, uh, and, and, and the real prospect of financial ruin. So I'm wondering, is there a simple, readily understandable way that you can explain how this all snowballed the way that it did and how you seem so powerless to stop it? Um. I'll try. It's it's not the easiest thing to condense, but let me have a have a go at it. Okay. The core to it was, and this requires a certain amount of mind reading, which is something I'm not happy with, not qualified to do, and as a as a nonfiction writer, I, I'm always very wary of, of imputing thoughts to people when it's just speculative. Mm -hmm. I, even even you know, it helps sell books though, like, like Roosevelt. It does help sell books. Though. Yeah, well, you've <laughs> got to do a bit of it, you know, otherwise you can't explain anything. But um, uh, Richard Breeden, the former chairman of the SEC, uh, by the time this whole thing started and in the post-Enron era, it was tremendously in vogue to get quite militant about corporate governance issues, uh, had the ambition to make himself Mr. Corporate Governance. Uh, he was brought in as counsel to the special committee. I had no objection to a special committee because I didn't realize, I had no idea how dangerous they could be. Uh, because I thought, the, the, as you say, Tweedy Brown was suggesting we were overpaid. Not that it was unauthorized, but it was just too much money. And of course it was authorized. But, and it wasn't too much money, but that's not the issue. That was their allegation, and they were phoning around, talking to competing newspapers, saying this, which is difficult in that business. Your competitors are publishing this stuff. And, um, and so I thought, this will clear the air. Well, one of the members of the special committee 
uh, in effect, brought Breeden in because he'd known him in government. They'd both been in government together in different in different branches of the government, and the apparent deal was, you know, you get all the profit from this, and it's a very profitable commission being a counsel to a special committee in a big company, and and you know we'll cooperate with you, but you make sure the audit committee doesn't you know, suffer too badly, and. Um, and Breeden took over, and he developed. He discovered that one of my partners had done some bad things, then unknown to me, my, and I was the chief victim of them. In that rollover plea bargain American system, my partner then said to the Justice Department, "Don't worry, uh, give me a, 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 a easy ride here, and I'll get the big fish for you, my senior partner, Black. I'll bring him down for you." And uh, and meanwhile, I had objected to Breeden violating the agreement we made, so he became full of uh, uh, vindictive and negative thoughts. He sold the whole thing, or helped sell it to the Justice Department, and that's how we got this tremendous escalation to the, the, the 17 counts were, were bruited, only 16 were laid, mm. and of those, uh, three were abandoned. Uh, two not made, one abandoned in progress. And then the jurors rejected nine, and the Supreme Court vacated the rest. But um, uh, that, uh, that's how it escalated, and, and it, it's terribly insidious the way this process works. There's no independent monitoring process, and the, the Fifth Amendment promise of a grand jury, of course, in practice, doesn't do anything to prevent capricious prosecution. Prosecutors, as everyone knows, in mm -hmm. practice get anything they want out of grand juries. You've never stopped insisting on your innocence, and you've been very consistent about that. But in your most recently published memoir, you do write, quote, my pride and haughty spirit were of the nature that often leads to a fall. Um, were you acknowledging there that uh, character is fate? Uh, and, and that the ruthlessness of the people you were up against notwithstanding and the iniquities of the American justice system notwithstanding, there was something about you, a tragic flaw, if you will, that did not play a minor role in your downfall? I wouldn't put it in quite those terms. Uh, first of all, tactically, I was, I was taking as much as I conscientiously could on myself in, in terms of blame in order to strengthen the plausibility of my basic claim that I was innocent of, of crimes, which was the chief count, not not to comment on my character, whether I was guilty of pride or whatever. Mm. It, it was, did this man actually commit crimes and is he a felon? So in order to strengthen the argument against that allegation, I r rather uh, uh, opened the kimono somewhat exaggeratedly on the character side, in my opinion. Uh, now, self-judgments are always questionable, but that's my opinion. Of course, everybody loves a redemption story, and, 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 and at least not quite as much as they love a downfall. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, they want both. I mean, that's two sides of the same story, they're happy, right? They're happy for the downfall, but they can take a redemption too. Yeah, yeah. you just got to get the sequence right. Right, <laughs> absolutely. And, and but in at least a couple of interviews that I've seen, uh, you have. Uh, uh, acknowledged or, or that you're a humbler person now, a more empathetic person. And, and I get the sense when I watch those interviews that the people who you're talking to uh, want to hear that, right? But I also notice that your wife, Barbara, doesn't seem to want anything at all to do with that particular narrative. Uh, she told Vanity Fair a while ago, quote, when it comes to petty irritations, the chief offender has been the notion that prison has changed Conrad. All that changed was that people who barely knew him or did not know him at all changed their views of him. Um, is your wife missing something? Uh, no, she, but she knows me in a way that for obvious reasons, as wives do, that others that, that others don't. And uh, she knew that I was never this ogre that I was presented as. Uh, and, and I mean, you know the atmospherics and pyrotechnics that go on around this kind of a, mm -hmm. a confected drama. And uh, so I was portrayed as some frightfully self-important person, which I never was. I don't think, anyway. I mean, I was, uh, one thing, that, by the way, I, I will emphasize is try as the opposition did 
they could not find one person that had worked with me that had an unpleasant word to say about me, not mm -hmm. one hint of discourtesy to anyone. Because I'm, if I may say it, a gentleman, and I'm never impolite to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless unless they're peers with whom I'm having a serious dispute, and even then, I confine it to the subjects we're disputing, not not reflections on them as individuals. And um, and Barbara's point was, uh, it was widely assumed that in a, in a you know when I was guest of the American people that all these pretty informal and some of them rather dodgy characters would take against me because I was a member of the House of Lords and spoke with you know, polysyllabic. I got on like smoke with them. I get on fine with everybody. Oh, I never had a problem getting on with anyone. Oh. And, uh, you know, there were 200 people wanted to accompany me to the gate when I left the first prison at uh, Coleman, you know, when I was released right. following the Supreme Court vacation of the counts. But when, when she hears you say, I'm humbler now, I'm more empathetic. No, I didn't to say that. I, I did not actually said, use those words. I, 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 I thought you said humbler. I, I, th th that is not the word I use. We'll, we'll I get think. the tape. As a result of what's happened to you, are you a humbler man? I hope so. What do you think? I think so. I think so. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to be in the position of morally signing my own expense account here. I, I've tried. I do my best. I am a conscientious Christian who does try to be a decent person, and, and uh, I'm not under the illusion I have the smallest ego in the world, but I'm courteous to everybody. I'm an honest man, and I do my best, and I fight my corner, and that's all I do. May he be he put the word in your mouth. I don't and know. look, it may be true, but yeah. I, I'm always a, a little skeptical of people kind of signing their own personality expense accounts and sure. saying, I'm a better person now, I'm a humbler person. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, we have to suspect our own judgment a bit when we're talking <laughs> about ourselves, so I tend to defer to my wife for that matter. But, but look, I, I think there is this much truth to it, that it was a broadening experience, and it was certainly an eye-opener to see how terribly unjust the system is. Just how many people who can't, I mean, I am at least a well-to-do person who uh, all through my time there wrote these columns that had millions of readers. I mean, I was sitting in a prison, but I was sending out columns to the National Review and the National Post and elsewhere, and, and I had a very large readership, and, and, and the prison knew that. And I had very prominent lawyers coming to visit me, and they knew that. But the average person can't do that, and he's just ground to powder. And, mm -hmm. and many of them are no more guilty of anything than I am. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't defend themselves. So if you could go back in time and, say, have a short chat with the Conrad Black who existed, say, in the late 1990s, uh, when you had three or four gorgeous homes as opposed to just one, and you were throwing very, very nice parties and hobnobbing with, you know, Margaret Thatcher and Lady Diana uh, and, and Tony Blair. If you could go back in time and have a few words with that high-flying guy, apart from specific legal advice, what would you most want to tell him? Well, it would be specific things. Uh, I was I was never uh, unaware, being something of a historian, of the potential of people's fortunes to fluctuate, and I was always wary of any vulnerability anywhere. But the, but the area I never foresaw and had no reason to foresee, I must say, in my own defense, was that my partner would in fact be committing crimes. Mm that he would be caught committing crimes and that he could avail himself of the American plea bargain system and throw me under the proverbial bus to save himself. And, and there just wasn't any reason for me sitting in, in my office in London to, to imagine such a thing would happen. I'd been in business with this man for over 30 years. Why could I possibly have thought he would do such things? Mm -hmm. Since I got you on this time travel wicket, let me take you a bit, a, a bit further back, and, and, and I want to ask you about the life you led in this house, in this house that you grew up in. Um, you were, you would have to admit, an unusual child, right? Uh, possibly, yes. Um, well, I, I read that by the age of 10, you had committed to memory all of the tactics that Napoleon had employed. 
Uh, yeah, I, I was a little later than a little 10. Later. It wasn't all of the tactics, <laughs> but his main battles, yeah. I also read that you had committed to memory the tonnages of dozens of ships in the Spanish Armada. Not, not the Spanish Armada. I was never interested in sailing See, my ships, memory but, say, is terrible. The, yeah. the, no, but that <laughs> allegation was made. It's like this theory that I had a lot of toy soldiers. I, I did not. I never did. But I, I did know the tonnages of great ocean liners and, and World War One and World War Two battleships and battle cruisers, and if, if, if you've been around the house a bit, there I have models of a lot of them around here. And what I read that you had committed to memory the daily casualty reports coming out of Leningrad during World War II. That is not, not That's the un- case, not, not, All not, right. not daily, uh, but, but uh, a lot of statistics like that from different So I know you're not given a false modesty, so I'll ask you this uh, directly. Uh, do you have a photographic memory? No, no but, uh, but I have... Um, I have a pretty good memory, but no, it is certainly not photographic, and, and as my wife would be the first to tell you, I do forget things sometimes. But is it the things you want to forget? <laughs> <laughs> I find those are the hardest things to forget. <laughs> those are the ones that tend to remain stubbornly in your thoughts. But for all of your obvious gifts, you were not exactly a successful uh, student as, uh, as a young uh, person. Um, uh, not in school until the end when I became so exasperated with the school system, I quit completely, prepared myself for the examinations, which you could do in this jurisdiction then to matriculate, to graduate from, from secondary school. And I did, and in those days, there were nine examinations, and you had to pass them all, or you did not matriculate. And I did pass them all, and mm-hmm. I prepared myself for them. And I thought, I thought that was something of achievement. Then I did do generally quite well in university, and I had right. three degrees at the end of it. But as you've described uh, elsewhere, you were expelled from two schools, uh, one for insubordination, another. They're both for insubordination. Yeah, basically. well, the other one was more interesting. It had to do with you uh, stealing tests and then selling them uh, to your classmates. Technically selling stolen tests. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, is it true that your father actually took some pride in what you had done? He thought that this showed entrepreneurial. No, promise? he didn't take any pride in it. He, he 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 thought it was a bad thing, but he did say that he 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 could detect a spirit of enterprise and independent thinking, and he could understand any sort of spirit of rebelliousness because it was it was a somewhat severe school on the old English model, but. Um, you know, sort of Tom Brown school day sort of thing, but uh, so he thought that there was there was uh, there were certain character traits that could be turned to advantage if I just channeled them in ways that didn't put me afoul of of, of uh, you know just didn't and then he, cross then he, the double white line. Didn't he in fact me. defend you to uh, the school administrators by saying, "Hey, this kid's showing some uh, well, well, initiative." Well, I, I, I'm not exactly sure if he tried that line, on him, <laughs> but he, he did his best. Uh, <laughs> There was a time in your life when you actually considered the idea of becoming a psychoanalyst. That's right. And this was at the same time, as my understanding, at the same time that you yourself were being treated for these serious uh, anxiety attacks. And I, I read the symptoms included shortness of breath, chest pain, choking fear of going crazy, and vomiting. No, I didn't vomit. You didn't? I, I thought you had carried a, a vomit bag around you everywhere ah, you went. But that was part of the anxiety. The uh, nature of the anxiety is what you're afraid of happening doesn't happen. I see. Any more than I committed suicide. I was afraid I would vomit, but I didn't. So what was all that about? Well, I know we're getting a little too personal. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I think I succeeded with my supervisor in identifying the causes. And then it's the nature of. Uh, yeah, you uh, never ident- you never told anyone what you found. No, during, no we, I, we're I mean, not going to make we're not going to make news here on yeah, that. No, and I don't think it'll be very interesting <laughs> news, by the way. But they they were c- quite simple and mundane things. But the, of the nature of that sort of problem, uh, a, a at worst neurotic problem, but they can be very distracting. I only had two real anxiety. Uh, reactions, full-scale ones, where I where I actually lost consciousness briefly, but they were they they were they were very uncomfortable. But um, uh, the nature of them is once you identify what the cause is, uh, the the consequences uh, 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 of that arise from trying to repress the cause in your conscious thoughts steadily erodes mm. and it falls away quite quickly. So. Like many people who are candidate psychoanalysts, I was really there 
to give myself a high comfort level that I wouldn't suffer from this sort of discomfort again. And I got to that high comfort level, and my supervisor said, look, you can continue, and you would, you would ultimately succeed in being qualified. You can, you can do the work all right, but, um, but is it what you want to do? Mm. And I said, well, no, I don't think so. Because he said, look, you're not neurotic. Uh, you're, you're, you're fine. I mean, we all have our ups and downs, but you're fine. You're a sane person, and you're all right. Um, and you have nothing unusual to fear. I mean, we're not always on a perfect high of, you know, Pollyanna-like jubilation every waking and sleeping moment of our long lives. But, but you'll operate. Gee, that's what it. I thought. <laughs> yeah, every day is inexhaustible <laughs> stories and pleasures. I found that in the last decade, especially. But the, uh, but the, um, but you'll operate within very manageable parameters. Yeah. And and that and that has been the case, e even in these frankly rather difficult times I had in the last few years. I mean, not very recently, but a few years ago. No anxiety attacks during this. N no, I kind of diffused fear that the worst of it. I wondered if I, yeah. I wondered. I just couldn't see how I was going to get through it. But there was never any alternative but to fight on and try to get through it. And, yeah. and, and I did get through it, of course. To, to, to round out your resume here, you have a law degree from Laval University, mm -hmm. even though you, I guess you never really intended to practice law. Yeah, uh, I, I considered that I might, but, but, I, but I was never particularly keen on it. Uh, I did have two cases, by the way, and I did uh, win them both, but then I retired. Really? Yeah. Uh, what kinds of cases? Uh, minimum wage cases. Minimum wage, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you also have a, a master's degree in history uh, from McGill, uh, but it was, I think, as a newspaper entrepreneur that you made your first real mark uh, on the world. Uh, as a CEO of Hollinger, you built this empire that included the London Telegraph, the Jerusalem Post, uh, and the Chicago Sun-Times, along with 500 other smaller newspapers. Uh, but even as you were building this empire, <coughs> You do not, you did not, it seems to me, uh, have much regard for journalists. Uh, you've called them, uh, you said that a large number of them are ignorant, lazy, intellectually dishonest, and inadequately supervised. You've also characterized them as a sniggering mass of jackals. Uh, mm. Do you still feel Those that way the, about the, my? They particularly <laughs> an appreciative moment. Um, Do you still feel that way about my distinguished, hardworking colleagues? Um, not, not uh, without exception. Certainly. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a serious answer to a slightly jocular question. And your your first quote, by the way, is going back to. Uh, uh, Submission we made to a royal commission. Yeah, it was a royal commission uh, in this country in 1969. That was a long time ago, mm -hmm. and I was particularly referring to uh, journalists in Quebec, where I lived at the time, reporting on the on the question, which was a burning question in this country, of whether Quebec would try and secede from the country. Right. Um, so, so I just want to give you the context on that. Look, on balance, I I, I think that. Most journalists, as people, to me, are, are are in fact quite pleasant people, as most people are. Um, but but the fact is, I do not have a high opinion of them as a group. I have a high opinion of individuals in amongst them, certainly many of them. But as a group, no. And I will take it one step further. I think two of the greatest criteria of our civilization are a free press and a society of laws. And I think. Broadly speaking, the media and the legal profession have failed. I think they failed our society, and I think they failed it very, very seriously. Who comes out I worse? I think the media are, are are not adequate, and the society of laws is largely corrupt and a cartel operated by the lawyers for their own benefit. I was just going to ask you, who comes out worse in your estimation, lawyers or journalists? Uh, actually, lawyers, because that's comforting. Because, uh, because they are a learned profession, and while journalists sometimes journalists put don't on have the to airs, know anything, yeah, yeah, put on the airs of being a learned profession, they right. aren't. And and secondly, because they do swaddle themselves in the nobility, the sanctity, of 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 the law and the and, and the whole concept of legitimacy, and journalists don't. They generally acknowledge that their their job is to entertain and inform and they, that they frequently do it in, in somewhat questionable ways. Yeah, most of us are drunks actually, so it's... A <laughs> well, yeah, I think they're a little less so than they were. That's well, true. At the time I said that That's was true. true, most of them were That's drunks. That's true. I, I, my impression is they've cleaned it up a yeah. bit. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's only and part of that is getting more female journalists than there were. In the, I guess that's the, part their, of it. Yeah, their conduct, at least in matters. And like also, that. our con you know, the latest generation has a, a weaker constitution. You know, again, they, exactly. Yeah. I, I think they're just more fitness minded. Aren't yeah, they? they've been. Yeah, they've been proselytized by the by the fitness advocates. You know, they watched Richard Simmons on television or something. Before your criminal trial uh, in, in, in July of 2007, uh, one of the concerns your lawyers raised was because the criminal indictment against you uh, cast so many aspersions on your fancy lifestyle, you know, the servants, the homes, et cetera, that uh, it, was, it would not be possible for an ordinary group of jurors to judge you fairly. Uh, is that a concern that you share? To some degree, yeah. But I mean, do you think only rich people should judge rich people? No, no, I do so not. So how do you get around that? Um. Well, how do you fight the spirit of envy? Uh, I guess it has to be a two-pronged sort of pincers activity. The judge has to admonish the jurors in the most strenuous terms that that the issue is did the accused do what the accused is accused of doing it has absolutely nothing to do with what you think of that person's personality or the way he or she lived or what you think even of his lawyer or her lawyer uh, yeah it, it, it isn't a personality question at all this person is not running for of course uh, for foreman of the jury but these the, jurors the, the, are the, human the person, beings uh, right. you know a life is at stake here the person's liberty is at stake and i mean in an extreme case maybe the person's life is at stake in, <laughs> in a jurisdiction that has the death penalty as most of the u.s does but uh, 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 and and that decision rests with you, but you must make the decision on the basis of the right criteria and not the wrong ones. And secondly, it's up to the individual, the accused, to try and comport himself in the case of a male defendant in a way that isn't just gratuitously annoying to the jury. But that's that's the best you can do. So if you had been found guilty, of all of those counts, all 16 counts, uh, you could very well have spent the rest of your life in prison. Be before the jury began its deliberations, had you emotionally prepared yourself for that possibility? No, I, I did not accept there was any chance that we were going to go down that badly. Uh, I, I mean, some of the charges were just such nonsense. I, I, I was really quite confident we'd get it. But you realize you came very close. Well, I'm not sure how close we came. I mean, you, there were interviews done with jurors you know, I, I afterwards. I saw them, but it also... The first vote was 9 to 3 to, vote, to uh, convict you of everything. Um, but the three that voted uh, against that voted to acquit me of everything. And they hung in there in right. a way that the other nine didn't. Did you see the interview with Jean Kelly, the, yeah, uh, the I juror? Saw, yeah, I saw her, yeah. According to her testimony, if you will, after the trial, she was the one who hung in there and went through all of the evidence and found a footnote buried in a document that your lawyer hadn't even thought to present, which she then used to turn around her uh, fellow jurors. Uh, no, I don't doubt that she was a fair-minded person, but I think she exaggerates slightly the degree to which uh, the, the defense hadn't presented that evidence. But as you know, the problem is mm -hmm. The jurors can't by right go to the transcript. They have to rely on their memories and they have to ask for specific things. And she did that. And she got that on an exhibit, I think. Right. Uh, but, but uh, you know, you, it's a very, it, it, you know, it's a real game of roulette and, and, and with odds yeah. overwhelmingly in favor of the House to, to get a, a, a jury like that, that that really, I don't think anyone on that jury had any background in the kind of thing that they were judging. I mean, a, a complicated series of business facts. Um, have a trial of over four months and tell them to rely on their memory. I mean, they, with the best will in the world, I think most of them were good people. I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm accused of looking down my nose at the jury. I don't. I, you know, in the early days when we were choosing a jury. Uh, some British journalist said, a jury of your peers, Lord Black. And I said, any citizen of this great country is my peer. 
and, and which was one of my several PR successes during the trial. Uh, but it happens to be my view. I don't look down at people because they have less money than I do or less education. I, I'm wondering, even if what Gene Kelly says is partially true, mm. what does that say about the quality of the represent, representation you got at the trial? Um, I, I, I think I think it may not be overwhelmingly flattering towards uh, towards it, but um, but I think I think it is less flattering in its reflections on the nature of an American criminal trial mm -hmm. and uh, and the um, and the cognitive uh, capacities of the jurors. You know, when you think back on this ordeal that you've went, been through, which really, I guess, from beginning to end was nine, ten years out of your life. Mm -hmm. What would you say caused you the more, uh, the most anguish? Was it being outmaneuvered by your enemies or betrayed by your friends? Certainly more the second, because I always thought that I would, I would win in the end, and, I, and in my opinion I have. I realize that there are those who, for their own reasons, whether intellectually legitimate or, or based on um, uh, ungenerous opinions toward myself, uh, would contest that, but given the correlation of forces and the fact that I was facing a 99 and a half to one mm. likelihood of of, uh, of being convicted and much more heavily convicted than I have been, even if the these last two spuriously retrieved counts stand, um, uh, I, I feel I've done quite well, and uh, and I, you know, I certainly made it abundantly clear that I made no compromise with the idea of whether I was guilty or not, and I made it absolutely clear that I was not intimidated by the vast apparatus of the U.S. justice and prison system, which is designed to humiliate, demean, break the spirit, crush, and pulverize to powder psychologically, financially, and if necessary, physically, everybody that. It rolls over um, and so I feel I've done quite well but but I found some of the betrayals of which you speak uh, quite shocking and and but very instructive and here I must agree uh, with part of the earlier question you put about the, my own development through all this I have a I mean I wasn't I wasn't a naive person before I didn't just come out of a bubble I'd you've been around the track a few times but I did I, I did not realize the the degree to which people are susceptible to to doing completely dishonest things under under levels of pressure that I would have thought resistible Continuing on with this theme of betrayal, um, there was a Hollinger board meeting that, that occurred in January of 2004, which you described in your memoirs being particularly disagreeable. This was the meeting in which the board voted to approve a $200 million lawsuit against you, which, as you point out, quickly escalated to a billion dollars. Uh, with, with the uniquely American cultural um, concept of civil racketeering. Right. And so what was it like for you to get through that meeting? This was all done it, it was over the telephone. Yeah, right? And not only was it nauseating, as I believe I put in my book, at the end of the meeting, my colleague Dan Colson, yeah. who was taking the meeting by telephone from England, went to his washroom and actually threw up. I mean, he, he was literally driven to nausea by it. I mean, I had that impulse, but I didn't physically uh, complete it. Another member of that board was Henry Kissinger, who you considered to be a very good friend. And he never ceased to claim that he was. And, and after he voted in favor of the lawsuit, what did you say to him? Do you remember? Well, I didn't hear him, so I, I said, uh, Henry, how did you vote? And he, did, I said, did you vote in favor of the motion? And he said, yes. And then I said, et tu, Brute. That sort of hung in the air. I will say that uh, I've had a reconciliation with him, and he's writing the foreword to my next book. And uh, and, um, uh, and uh, but we, you were very hurt by his. I was. What you viewed as his betrayal. Uh, betrayal might be slightly overstating it. I I I, I felt badly let down. Yes. But and, and you were a bit. Sh were you shocked by it? Not completely, because Mr. Nixon told right. me that. Um, 
and, and, and Mr. Nixon imputed it to the fact that he was, after all, of, and his family fugitives from the Nazis and was quite cautious about these things, but that when the heat came up, he would go to a neutral corner. His, his answer was maneuver. You know, he wrote his first famous book about Metternich and, and, and uh, was an admirer of the manner in which the Habsburgs kept that ramshackle empire going for 700 years, comprised of all these different nationalities. Yeah. And, and he is a maneuverer, and he's very good at it. And, and that's, that's the nature of the beast. You have to make some allowance for him. I mean, I guess I'm curious about the nature of the relationship, because everything I've read about Kissinger, and I'm including in that uh, what I read about Kissinger in your biography of Richard Nixon, mm. tells me that he's an amoral, duplicitous person. Sometimes duplicitous, certainly. I would say not quite amoral. As I wrote in, in the book that we're largely talking about here, the one that dealt with these legal travails, um, isolated from pressures, he's a man of normal and strong sentiment and commendable sentiment, a generous, spirited person. Uh, who was quite affected by by sad events, and I referred to when he and I went to visit John Aspinall in England just a few weeks before John died, and he was clearly not going to live much longer. Um, but if 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 he feels any threat to his own position or interests, he he applies his great talents to self-defense ahead of to solidarity with someone that he may like and sympathize with, but, but in but the hierarchy yeah. of his motives, there's not much But that doesn't there. make him a friend you can depend on in a tough time. Uh, there are horses for courses, you know. You have already said that you're no fan of the corporate governance movement, and you've called some of the people that you've been up against uh, corporate governance terrorists. Uh, and you certainly don't very much like the idea of institutional investors going in and telling a board of directors who the CEO should be and how much the CEO should be paid and how the company should be run. But when you got a company, let's say, that has a board of directors uh, that has been handpicked by the CEO, and, and, and those directors show no inclination whatsoever to say no to the CEO on just about anything, uh, might not a shareholder revolt once in a while be a good thing? Uh, I have no problem with a shareholder revolt. The shareholders, if they don't... Uh if they don't like the way the company is run, they should either stay in and advocate a change or sell the shares. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in the scenario, yes, and in the scenario you said, if, if the directors are not objecting to mistakes being imposed by chief executive, then, then the shareholders revolt would be perfectly justified. Your, your, your board at Hollinger's was no, yeah, but Wait a minute. Right, we did nothing but make money for these people. Right. Uh, and uh, I don't see where they had any right to complain. And what the directors should have done, despite the antics of the prosecutors, is say, look, we voted the money to these people because they earned the money. They ran the company well. It's a difficult, highly competitive business. They took these clapped out newspapers that were trading insolvent or losing money and, and built them up. I mean, Chicago we took from losing money to $85 million a year. We bought control, I bought control of uh, the Daily Telegraph for $30 million and was sold for $1,327,000,000 after we'd taken $400 million out of it in dividends. Mm -hmm over a period of time. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we made over a billion dollars on the community newspapers in the U.S. and two billion dollars in the Canadian newspapers, capital gains. Now, what are you going to have a shareholder's revolt for? And, um, and when Mr. Corporate Governance, the formerly much venerated Richard Breeden and his cronies and, and fellow larcenists took over, they vaporized $2 billion of shareholder value. They brought financial sorrow to tens of thousands of homes throughout the United States and Canada. They took a strong company that even a year after we had all gone uh, ha had a strong share price and ruined it, destroyed it completely, uh, left it in ashes and rubble and took $300 million for themselves. 
That's corporate governance. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, during your tenure <coughs> as, as CEO, the board at one point approved the expenditure of $8 million of the company's money to purchase Franklin, a collection of Franklin Roosevelt papers. Mm -hmm. How is that expenditure justified? It does seem like an odd expenditure for a company. Uh, how was it justified? Well, it was justified that it was good value and that uh, we would use some of it uh, as a sort of goodwill measure as a historical project that you'd travel around and be loaned to libraries and loaned to the Library of Congress. And I'd spoken to the congressional librarian, Mr. Billingsley, about that. And, um, uh, and, and that, you know, we had just sold a, a large chunk of our assets and had hundreds of millions of dollars in cash so it wasn't impinging upon normal operations and I presented it as an esoteric thing and there was vigorous debate about it but there was no dissent in the end because we had attestations that was worth more and it has proved to have been worth more. Did the board know that you were working on a biography of yes, Franklin and Roosevelt? Yes, I, I did not, I did not, uh, that Life of Roosevelt which you've been kind enough to read has over 2,000 footnotes in it and the, the Parts of the, what the company bought that are referred to in the footnotes take a grand total of four footnotes, and, and they were matters that are publicly known anyway. I didn't have to spend a lot of money to buy them to be able to cite those sources. Mm -hmm. they, they, were, they were matters that were published. They weren't revelations. I, the value of these things was they were originals of things, the contents of which were well known, like a, a, a speech text for the war message, for example. A, day of infamy speech. Well, the text of that speech is well yeah. known. You can watch it on YouTube. So the purchase of those papers did not personally uh, uh, provide a great benefit to you in the, of in the writing not. of this book? Absolutely not. Uh -huh. no. You uh, checked into the Coleman Federal Prison, I guess it was uh, in March of 2008. Um, as a man who was accustomed to uh, the finer things in life, how, how difficult was it for you to uh, adjust to prison life? No, not that bad. I, I, yes, I am accustomed to them and I enjoy them, but I, I did never defined myself as a creature or dependent of luxury. I, you know, I don't. But it's I, I don't easy to get used to luxury, isn't it? Oh yeah, sure, it? and I'm you know, <laughs> and, and I'm happy to get used to it, and I enjoy it as much as anybody. But uh, uh, you can do without, you know. I mean, the fact is, in the end, I ate quite well. Not not in the cafeteria, but people prepared who were. Good. You know, there was a to, chef uh, there yeah, that at the you second friend I was at. Yeah, uh, yeah, there was, and uh, you gained some weight. I did, I did, but that was because I tore. Uh, I used to walk a lot, and counterbalanced um, uh, my evening meal with with uh, with a, a nice walk around the lake that they have at the Miami prison, but. Um, uh, but then I tore the meniscus in one knee, and, and uh, the medical advice in that place was not terribly reliable, but I emailed my doctor, and uh, both in New York and in Toronto, and they gave me the same advice. I was afraid it was a, you know, a, a phlebitis or something. I said, no, 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 it's a torn meniscus, so just stay off your feet as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So I stopped walking, and then I put on weight. But I've taken it off. I've lost over 30 pounds since I've been back. One of the grittier details that you provide in your memoir about prison life has to do with anal cavity searches. Uh, in fact, you write uh, quote, that you were, quote, slightly mystified at the extent of the official curiosity about that generally unremitting aperture. Uh, would you say that I there mean unremitting <laughs> in its normal function. <laughs> would you say there were legitimate Which in fairness is not what they were seeking. I'm not no. accusing them. Of right. Well, I was just going to ask you, what, do, do you I mean, think that there were legitimate security reasons for this curiosity, or were they just trying to humiliate you? Uh, not me personally, but as prisoners, all of us. Yeah, uh, so uh, that, that was, was the I mean, function of it. Henry Kissinger came to see me, or Brian Mulroney, the former prime minister of this country, or just other prominent people in different occupations. Uh, Kissinger got an anal cavity search? No, no, he didn't, oh. but I did. I oh. know, they wouldn't do that to okay. visitors. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I did after he had visited, you see. Yeah. Um, as if these people as would As if be Kissinger handy. would pass you a, a hacksaw. 
uh, yeah, or, or uh, uh, Valium pill or something. You see, uh -huh. it, it's all a complete scam because there is a lot of smuggling into these prisons. None of it, zero, comes through the visitor center. It all comes through corrupted officials. They bring it in. Uh, they circulate it. They're, they're unskilled labor. They're not highly paid. And they, they do the smuggling. But they go through this charade of pretending that the, the, the smuggling comes through visitors and the visitor's room through the prisoners. It's complete bunk, and everyone knows it. It's, it's just, in Napoleon's phrase, it's lies agreed upon. It's just a little theater to pretend that what, what everyone knows is happening isn't happening. You also write about your first encounter with a member of the Genovese family. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Indeed. Describe that. Well, um, at the first night I was there, I, I was talking to a couple of people, and obviously that I just met. But the, I was very cordially greeted there. I must say, people were quite friendly, and um, and my case had received a lot of publicity. And, and and they tend to like people who fight cases, you know, because most of them don't have the means to fight. They just get bulldozed. And and then we saw this approaching phalanx. And people sort of stepped aside a bit, so I assumed this was a, an imminent inmate, but I didn't know who it was. I mean, you can kind of figure out generically who it would be. And uh, so he said, "Welcome." And um, what did he look like? Is uh, he scary looking? No, he's very presentable. Was he a hit man or? What, what? No, I, 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 I don't want to <laughs> get into names here, but I, right. I think he was in fact the Don. Uh -huh. But um, he. Um, you know, he, he was a man of medium stature, uh, very, you know, certainly no scars or anything like that, very <coughs> presentable, quite well-spoken, very courtly man, very nice fellow. I mean, I don't doubt he'd be a very difficult person to have a disagreement with, but he couldn't have been more uh, uh, equable with me. But he, he said, um, no one will bother you here. Now, no one really does bother people in low security places anyway, but he, and then I so said, I didn't come in. He, and then he said, uh, if you catch a cold, we'll find out who you got it from. <laughs> it was sort of a, you know, like a line from a movie, you know. But um, It sounds right out of central casting, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And then, and then he said, um, actually, one of, one of his people said, uh, do you want anything? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, do you want a bottle of whiskey or some cigarettes or a cell phone or something? I said, no. I, I said, look, I, I'm fighting my battle in the court system, and I, I don't, I don't want to muddy the waters having a disagreement with the BOP. I've got to have a clean record here. I'm, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I'm fighting along the lines I am, and I, I, I'm going to stick to that. But thank you for offering. And then I used to see him quite often in the evenings. We'd walk together for a while, and he was a very interesting man. He wrote a history of Sicily that he gave me to read. I mean, it wasn't. Uh, you know, it wasn't uh, Sismondi's history of the Italian Republic, but it was quite a literate work. Mm. You know, uh, he, he was he was a very uh, he was a very interesting man. I, I his arrangement was that he would he pleaded guilty to one count, took I think five years in a low security place, and never touched anything illegal again and would not be prosecuted again. And I believe that that's been adhered to all the way around. He's retired. He's comfortable. He's retired. And uh, and they, they're not bothering him. Didn't he say, too, that uh, you and he shared something in common? That's right. He said, you know, we have a lot in common. And I said, uh, you mean we're both victims of this system? You say, I mean, how much he was a victim of the system, I don't know, but uh, if at all. But he said, well, not just that. We're industrialists. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some truth to it. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 I'll tell you something else funny he said. Um, I mean, I gather that these people have essentially decamped from legally controversial areas and moved their assets in, into places that are legal, and they're just sort of regular businessmen now. Uh, but he said, you know, um, uh, the, we Italians are clearing out of the whole crime business and and I know that uh, we were very notorious but I'll tell you something I, I have uh, 
I have seen these Russians and Chinese who are replacing us, and it'll not be long before the police and the prosecutors get awfully nostalgic for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, look, we had certain limits. We never bothered anybody other than those who got right into our area, and, and, uh, and, and we were always careful with children and women, and uh, you know, we had certain principles, but uh, these people are, are, these people are, you know, it's equal opportunity danger to everyone. You know? Who do you think uh, fares better in prison, people who know they're guilty or people who sincerely believe they're innocent? Um, it's the it's the ones in between. The, the ones who know they're guilty are often people who uh, they don't have that burning sense of injustice. But many of them do feel if the sentence isn't too impossible, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can come back from this. I, I I I made a mistake. I'm paying for the mistake, but I will still have a life at the end of it, and I'll and I'll make the most of it. And and um, and those ones get through okay, and the ones who are innocent uh, generally have a certain reservoir of, of not exactly self righteousness, but fighting for good cause even though they're not winning the fight. I mean, I know something about that, um, and and that is quite motivating. The 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 ones that are just broken by the system are ones that. <clears throat> may be guilty of something and are just terribly over sentenced and that's a great many people and and they they're just they're just beaten down by it. they just become hopeless. Now let's talk a little bit about Richard Nixon. Hmm. Uh, your biography <coughs> of him was published in 2007, <coughs> weighed in at about 1100 pages. Uh, some reviewers thought that you were just a little too nice to Nixon and, and that perhaps uh, because of the legal problems that you were going through that you could not write entirely objectively about his legal problems. Uh, do you think the critics were entirely wrong about that? We both had legal problems, but um, whether it reduced objectivity, I don't think so. I think it gave me uh, uh, and you may say this amounts to the same thing. It gave me a, a perhaps a greater predilection to be sympathetic to someone attacked in the way Nixon was. But in, you've read the book, and you know that I was extremely critical of the way he handled the whole. Yes, thing. you interviewed him several times, right? Well, I met him. I went to his house. I Did he have trouble office. looking you in the eye? No, he was fine with me. Okay, cause... got on like smoke. And I think in his last five years, he was pretty relaxed compared uh -huh. to what he had been. One you know that line of Milton's, my soul serene, all passion spent, uh, that's how he was. Uh -huh. you know, I, he said to me once that uh, uh, he, he, you know, he was born in a somewhat disadvantaged uh, family and the two brothers died in, in their youth because they really didn't have the money to treat their tuberculosis. And, um, and he said, and you know, I've, I've had, uh, 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 considering where I started, a remarkable career, and I think I've rendered some service, and the service remains. I've made some mistakes, and I think even my enemies, I have to admit, I paid for those mistakes. Mm. And, and I think he, I, and, you know, I think he was all right then. Along, of course, with your biography of Richard Nixon, there's the uh, biography you wrote of Franklin Roosevelt, which I guess weighs in at 1,200 pages rather than just simply well, 1,100 pages. He was pages. a in prison. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you and, say and, that as if as if I was overly verbose. Let me remind you. <laughs> no, no. It was Ken every Davis word was essential. Ken Davis produced five volumes and got to the end of 1942. Arthur Schlesinger had 2,500 pages to get us to. 1937. I mean, it was a big career. Well, and I don't think you'll mind me saying that your biography of Franklin Roosevelt is widely thought of as one of the best one-volume biographies of Franklin Roosevelt that's ever been written. Um, and you admire Franklin Roosevelt, oh, yeah. even though he was the president who created the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is an agency that has caused you and continues to cause you no shortage of grief. No, we're, we're pretty well finished now. We're 
you're just in uh -huh. the final settlement discussions now. Uh -huh. uh, if, we, if we don't reach a settlement, then my appeal will go ahead, but I, I'm hopeful of settling it. You're still certainly a capitalist. Uh, mm -hmm. You believe passionately in the free market, and, and people still describe you as a conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not that conservative. Well, I know that, but certainly not by American standards. No, no, no. Uh, no, 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 no I but you've also described yourself as an unambiguous leftist now when it comes to matters of crime and punishment. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I'm, and, and I have to say that uh, while in general I would be, I suppose, more a Republican than a Democratic supporter in the U.S. if I, if I, if I were there, um, uh, I'm not one of these people who, who is so horrified at the thought of Democratic nominees to the bench because I, I don't think the Republican judges care about civil rights. I mean, the fact is your Supreme Court has just sat there like suet puddings while the Bill of Rights has been put to the shredder. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the due process is not something anyone can rely on in a criminal proceeding. The grand jury is a farce. You don't get prompt justice. You don't normally get an impartial jury. You don't even get access to counsel of choice, which is the issue of my appeal, you know. And uh, you certainly don't get, um, as I said, you don't get prompt justice, but you don't get reasonable bail either. I mean, I was posting $38 million. What's, the, what's reasonable about that? Mm -hmm. It's 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 just a conveyor belt to the prison system, which is corrupt also. So I, I mean, I, I don't think the Democrats are blameless in all this, but I think they're less implicated in it than the Republicans. So this is my last question. As I was reading both of your memoirs, uh, both volumes, uh, and by the way, I, I enjoyed them oh, uh, tremendously. Uh, I was reminded of a line from a Bernard Malamud novel called The Natural, oh, yeah. and uh, in in the book, uh, uh, one of the characters shows up uh, in in a hospital room with the fallen hero, and the hero, the fallen hero, is lamenting how much better things could be, and then she kind of looks at him and says, uh, "You know, I believe we live two lives. Uh, there's the life we learn with, and the life we live with after that." And so, you know, you've had this extraordinary life. You've been through so much. Uh, how do you see the rest of your life playing out? I, I, obviously, it's a lottery ticket, and you don't know, how, you know, how, how the how the sort of medical side is going to work out. Mm. But I feel fine. I feel the same as I did 30 years ago. I'm 68, but I don't. I, mean, I don't think that's that old anyway. But I certainly don't feel old. But. Um, I feel that uh, I feel the best is yet to come. There were there were, even in those times you described before all these legal problems. There were great tensions at times, and there were great pressures of one sort or another. It was you read my earlier book. It was very complicated financial engineering, and once I got. Once we really got the Telegraph doing well in London, we had to face the price war for Murdoch, and it was a terrible threat. And and it was it was and then and then it soon you it came upon us that you could see the threat to the newspaper industry, which is why we had to really start exiting the business, which we were doing very successfully when the legal thing came up. But um, um, you know, I feel that each phase I've, I've handled reasonably well. In the end, I was a good student. I moved to Quebec. I learned French. I wrote a history a book about the history of Quebec. Then I became a newspaper publisher and a financier, and then mainly a financier until we got some big newspapers. But I did, if I may say it, quite well in both those fields. Then I was, you know, fighting legal injustice, and I held my corner as well as anyone could in the circumstances. And I uh, became a historian. And you were very gracious in your introductory remarks. But my books have all been well received. I, I, even, even you know, I mean, Nixon was a hard sell at any kind of rehabilitation. And I partially rehabilitated him mm -hmm. without whitewashing him at all. And um, and I and I, my next book will be out in a couple of months. My strategic history of the U.S. So it's nothing to do with me. So we're off anything controversial that way. And uh, and in which I do honor to all your great statesmen from Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, up to you know Henry Kissinger, but uh, Reagan, but. Um, um, I, 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 I feel well placed now to have a good uh, what what uh, a famous businessman years ago in Quebec called a golden afterburner. Lord Conrad Black, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Yeah.